Hi! In this short lecture I want to present my personal choice of some interesting astronomical results obtained in 2022. Definitely in the history we'll remember this year in astronomy as the year when the James Webb Space Telescope started to produce its first results. There are many lectures papers, presentations about these results, so I will not repeat them in detail. Uh, I just want to start with mentioning that in 2022 the most interesting results were related to galaxies and to exoplanet studies. The first publication was published in July this uh, set of results I'm presenting is mostly based on publications in the archive, uh, I mean in, on the website archive.org, and um, in the left bottom corner you can see the number of the paper, 2207, that's the year and the month, and um, then the number of the paper in a given month. So this paper was published um, in the end of July and uh, it represents uh, the results of the early release of scientific data from the James Webb Space Telescope. And as I said, uh, mainly these uh, results are related to studies of galaxies, including those um, which we see in the youth of our universe and uh, exoplanets. Also there are several beautiful images of different types of nebula and indeed observations in this part of the infrared are extremely interesting in this context. But uh, again I'm not going in details here but I want to describe one result obtained uh, using the James Webb data uh, this year. So this is um, a result about um, atmosphere of an exoplanet. This is a well-known exoplanet, uh, WASP-39b, and uh, this result is uh, remarkable uh, despite there are no beautiful pictures, um, it's not about early universe or something like that. Uh, this is detection of um, SO2. Um, the observers found uh, definite um, signs of the presence um, of this substance in the atmosphere of that planet. And this is important because we want to understand um, properties of um, atmospheres of exoplanets really in details. And um, in the scheme in the middle you see how uh, this molecule can be produced. And these uh, um, blue-green arrows, uh, they represent the main formation channel of SO2, and this is the channel which is related to photochemical reactions. So this discovery is the first discovery of a molecule which is produced uh, by photochemical processes in, in an atmosphere of an exoplanet. Uh, in my opinion, studies of exoplanet atmospheres are very important, not just by themselves, not because we are interested in exoplanets. Um, there is uh, something more important. If you consider what is the most important uh, scientific problem of the present day, maybe um, these are uh, several problems related to uh, evolution of the global climate on Earth. We do not understand it precisely on the time scale starting from several decades and we are really very interested in it. And uh, uh, this is a question which costs a lot. And uh, to produce good models for the Earth climate, we need much deeper understanding of uh, different physical processes in um, the atmosphere of our planet. And uh, typically, to develop a very detailed model with many ingredients, 
you need to study different parts, uh, different sections of this model uh, using different sets of observational data. And having just the atmosphere of the Earth and uh, several other planets in the solar system, actually you cannot probe all possibilities. But step by step we start to uh, study in more and more detail atmospheres of other planets. And now we have James Webb uh, in the orbit and uh, it's quite important to uh, learn more about physical processes in um, atmospheres of exoplanets. Very soon uh, a new European satellite, Ariel, will be launched and uh, this satellite is uh, specifically dedicated to studies of um, exoplanet atmospheres. And in my opinion, um, all these studies will push significantly the whole area of um, atmospheric physics and uh, this will bring more uh, talented young researchers to the field. Uh, this will produce lots of different codes which model um, evolution of atmospheres, their properties and so on. So that's why I decided to choose this particular result from the James Webb telescope to discuss it in some detail. Okay, that's enough for the James Webb. Uh, it's a wonderful instrument, but it's not the only high-level uh, instrument in orbit now. And uh, maybe for the whole astronomical community, uh, the most important instrument in orbit is um, the European satellite Gaia. In 2022, the third data release uh, was released. Uh, Gaia is observing since 2013 and it already fulfilled its main, its core program. But luckily the satellite is functioning perfectly and till it's possible observations will continue. So they will continue for a few years more. And uh, this uh, satellite produces huge set of data which uh, which finally will be all in open access. But initially it's necessary to uh, do some data reduction which can be done only by the team uh, specifically uh, focused on um, this topic. So uh, there will be several data releases and uh, now we have the third data release. Um, all uh, subsequent releases they contain more information this doesn't mean that there'll be more and more sources in the data set, but for uh, more and more sources, uh, there'll be more and more detailed parameters. In the third data release, now we have much more spectral data and um, also all subsequent releases include um, longer periods of observations. In the third data release we have now the first 34 months of observations, so nearly three years, and um, definitely um, different teams or even individual astronomers all over the world, they get ready for the new data release, they work with the data from previous releases, and immediately when the data is uh, in the open access, uh, people put their hands on it and start to run their codes. And so uh, new results appear very rapidly after the publication of uh, the data. So uh, it's not a miracle that in 2022 many uh, new papers uh, appeared which use already um, data from data release too. Okay, so uh, let me describe four results um, published this year. Uh, three of them use DR3 and one actually uses early release of DR3, so not the complete set. Well, uh, so the first result is related to white dwarf studies. White dwarfs are products of, um, of the stellar revolution, stars like our sun uh, and their lives as white dwarfs. So these objects are quite numerous. And they have quite interesting physics, which is not completely understood. Uh, but what is more important maybe, um, the history of the galaxy is 
written in white dwarfs. So if you study these types of objects, you can follow evolution of the star formation in the galaxy, uh, even with uh, some spatial resolution. You can follow chemical evolution of the galaxy. So these um, uh, these bodies are quite important. Uh, to do many advanced studies, you need uh, just uh, you do not need just lots of sources. You need a complete sample, uh, and. Uh, in this paper, published in November, as you see, um, the authors present the complete sample of white dwarfs inside 100 parsec around the sun. This is a huge result, uh, really. So it contains um, nearly 13,000 white dwarfs. And the whole set of white dwarfs in the DR3 is, by the way, about uh, 100,000. Uh, so the authors analyze this sample inside 100 parsec. Uh, they uh, represent lots of statistical data, and uh, definitely this result is very welcomed by many researchers working on white dwarfs or on the evolution of our galaxy and so on. So, uh, in my opinion, this is quite an important result, which will be highly cited, by the way, in near future. Uh, the second result uh, I want to mention is also about compact objects, but now about neutron stars and black holes. When in 60s, before discovery of radio pulsars, before discovery um, of black hole binaries, people already discussed how it's possible to identify these sources. And uh, Zeldovich and Gusainov in 1966, if I'm not mistaken, put forward a nice idea. You can use a very simple approach, actually uh, used before for different types of objects in normal stellar astronomy. You study binaries. Uh, neutron stars and black holes are products of uh, stellar evolution. Many stars are born in binary systems, or even in triple, quadruple, and so on. And uh, so some of neutron stars and black holes remain in binaries after their um, progenitors and their lives. So um, you can imagine that you don't see a neutron star or a black hole because there is no accretion and they're not bright sources. But looking at the normal stellar companion in a binary, you can notice that this normal star is a member of a binary system. How you can do it? There are two ways. The first, you can take spectra and uh, you can identify in uh, spectra of selected binaries that lines are periodically moving because of the Doppler effect. This means that uh, the star is uh, orbiting around the center of mass of the system. So you can determine the orbital period, you know the mass of the visible star, so you can calculate the mass of the invisible companion. If it is dark and massive enough, you can conclude that this is a neutron star or even a black hole. Um, the second approach is uh, even more simple, but actually more difficult technically. When a star, a normal star, a visible star, is moving around the center of mass, you really see that it is moving. So uh, it uh, draws a small ellipse on the sky uh, when it moves around the center of mass, and you can notice it. However, of course, uh, the, the shift uh, in the position of the star is really tiny, it's very difficult to measure it. Um, so, uh, step by step, with uh, new instruments, people now start to uh, look for neutron stars and black holes in uh, binary systems without accretion, uh, without any type of activity um, of a neutron star, I mean radio pulse or magnetar activity and so on. And they use both approaches. Um, thanks to many spectral measurements um, for stars um, done with the LAMOS telescope in China, uh, there are several candidates due to um, radial velocity variations. However, in this paper, the authors um, use another approach. So they use astrometry from Gaia and they really look for um, 
um, periodic uh, changes in the position of the star. So they start with the binary catalog uh, in the third release of um, Gaia. And this catalog include about 135,000 binaries. So uh, working with this huge set of data, they are uh, finally presenting a sample of just 24 systems. But these systems are really good candidates to host a neutron star or a black hole. They have orbital periods about a year, which uh, simply depends on the data set. So uh, we see only one star in a binary, so the second companion is not visible, it's a dark companion. And um, you have to select a mass limit uh, to deal just with neutron stars and black holes. And the most natural choice is the Chandrasekhar mass, 1.4 solar masses. Actually, neutron stars can be less massive, and it's well known from radio pulsar measurements, binary radio pulsar measurements, that neutron stars definitely can have masses down to 1.18 solar masses. Uh, maybe they can be slightly lighter. So there is overlap in the mass distribution of white dwarfs and neutron stars. And also it's important to underline that massive white dwarfs are actually quite rare. So larger is the mass of the white dwarf, uh, less is the number of such objects in the galaxy. So uh, 1.4 is a good choice. And of course, you never measure the mass precisely. You measure some distribution. You have some probability that the object has such and such mass. So this 1.4 is not a very strict limit, as you see in the plot. Uh, on the horizontal axis, um, this, this is just the number of the system. And on the vertical axis, that's the mass of the invisible companion. And uh, you see that for each system, you have some distribution, this 50 grades of gray. And um, uh, some of them uh, go down below 1.4 solar masses, but that's fine. Still, there is a high probability that this uh, object is a neutron star. You cannot prove it definitely uh, at the moment at least. But there is very high probability that that's a neutron star and not a white dwarf. Uh, visible companions on in these systems are mainly solar type stars of so FGK dwarfs. Um, there is one hot sub dwarf also. And uh, there are several important results visible here. Um, one of the most important probably is that there is, not, there is no gap in mass distribution between neutron stars and black holes. Um, when we measure uh, masses of neutron stars and black holes in X-ray binaries and for neutron stars also in systems with radio pulsars, we actually see a gap in the mass distribution. Uh, neutron stars cannot be more massive than roughly 2.2 solar masses. We do not know exactly this limit. It it might be, by the way, very sharp. So it's somewhere around 2.2 solar masses. Um, but black holes uh, in X-ray binary systems typically do not start at 2.5, for example, solar masses. Um, mostly uh, we see black holes starting with um, three or even five solar masses. So in between there is a gap. Uh, step by step it's filled by different approaches. Uh, we can use gravitational wave data to probe this range of masses. And as you know, probably in LIGO, uh, in their classification, uh, so separately they have neutron stars, black holes and systems from the gap. Uh, that's one piece of information. Then also um, gravitational microlensing can provide uh, some statistics to probe uh, mass distributions of compact objects. And now there are about a dozen of good candidates for isolated neutron stars and black holes detected by this method. Hopefully soon, especially using the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, known before as W first, uh, we'll uh, see lots of isolated neutron stars and black holes. Also Gaia can contribute here uh, due to astrometric microlensing. But uh, up to now, a sample of 24 um, source sources uh, which are not uh, radio pulsars or X-ray binaries, it's quite a significant sample. And it's very interesting that there is no gap here. It can uh, be very important for 
uh, models of um, core collapse of um, stars, of massive stars, because of course they are main progenitors of neutron stars and black holes. Okay, let's move on. Uh, the next result is about exoplanets. Actually, it's expected that uh, in maybe tier 5, so in a few years, Gaia will start to produce a huge number of exoplanet discoveries. But this will be done um, due to astrometric detections. Um, this is a, a new method, I would say. I mean, the, the method is known for ages, but up to now there is just one um, strong candidate to be an exoplanet discovered uh, by astrometry and what is surprising maybe um, it's due to radio observations so people observed a, white, uh, a red sorry a red dwarf um, red dwarfs are known radio sources because they are activity and uh, they found that the dwarf is uh, is a member of a system and um, Determination of the mass of the invisible companion um, gives us the result um, below 12 masses of Jupiter, so most probably that's a planet. A actually, it's more like uh, um, a Saturn. Uh, but um, that, that's the only result, and we're still waiting for astrometric detection of exoplanets by Gaia. Uh, still, this year, Gaia started to fill the list of exoplanets, um, and uh, we have Gaia 1b and Gaia 2b, two exoplanets, two hot Jupiters, discovered by normal um, transit technique. Gaia collects a huge set of photometric data for more than 1.5 billion stars and of course this data can be reduced to look for transits. And what is important in this paper, it's not that uh, people discovered another two hot Jupiters. There are lots of known hot Jupiters already and nothing specific about these two. What is important is that they um, developed a method, an algorithm, which can successfully uh, detect transit planets in the Gaia data. This result was validated um, using data from the TESS satellite and also it was validated by um, dedicated spectroscopic observations uh, with a large binocular telescope. So uh, these detections are very solid. And uh, so now people have a good method, um, probe method, tested method in, in their hands and uh, with new releases which will cover longer periods of observations. Uh, they might successfully detect lots of transit, uh, transiting planets. So we're waiting for new results when this data is public. And finally, uh, another result from Gaia. Uh, this, uh, I choose it mainly for, for fun. It's quite an interesting result. Maybe not too much big science, new physics or something like that inside, but it's just beautiful. Uh, we know that now Proxima Centauri is the closest star to the Sun. But of course it was not so before and it will change quite soon on astronomical time scale because stars are moving relative to each other. It's known that relative velocities of stars in the solar proximity is about 10 kilometers per second. Um, sometimes it's difficult to judge uh, how significant it is. Now let's uh, put a different question. How long shall we wait that um, two stars, two randomly chosen stars in the solar vicinity, uh, move from each other or towards each other by one parsec. One parsec is a typical separation between stars. And this time period is not too long, it's like 100,000 years. Uh, in the third data release, um, now people have uh, lots of data about stellar velocities. And so the author of this paper, published in July, um, made a study looking for um, uh, for stars which passed near the Sun in, during the last 10 million years, or for stars which will pass close to the Sun, um, I mean within one parsec, in the next uh, roughly 10 million years. And you see the results um, on the plot. Um, color represents the, the relative velocity 
of the star and the sun and the squares correspond to uh, questionable candidates so that is not that precise and circles to good candidates and we see that two closest uh, passages of stars near the sun are quite solid results and so we have circles and these are very low velocity um, stars so one um, passage uh, close to the sun happened uh, slightly less than 3 million years ago and the distance was uh, 0 0.05 parsec and the next um, close passage will happen in roughly 1.3 mega years uh, from now and the distance uh, will be comparable about 0 0.06 parsec from the Sun that's quite interesting because such stars uh, might uh, interact very actively with comets in the Oort cloud so it even can have uh, some effect uh, on the Earth and I don't know if you are writing science fiction <laughs> you can use this new result uh, to um, to use some real data in your novel or in your story. Okay, enough for Gaia and um, then I'll present several um, separate results and well not very different subjects. Um, these are individual results obtained with quite different instruments and technique. And uh, again I start with um, close uh, passages but uh, now it's not the sun and the star but a supermassive black hole and the star so it's well known that there are stars around our supermassive black hole Sagittarius A star and uh, thanks to such observations observations of these stars we know precisely the mass of the supermassive black hole and people continue to uh, follow orbits of these stars and they look for new stars and continuously um, they find stars uh, with uh, shorter and shorter orbits so with smaller and smaller semi-major axes and now we have a new record uh, the star is called S4716 um, it's quite difficult to observe the central region of our galaxy due to interstellar absorption and so people use um, infrared observations but with large ground-based telescopes uh, typically it's uh, VLT in the European and South Observatory you know that there are four 8 meters telescopes there they can work together in the interferometric mode and also um, CAC telescopes are used so this new star has a orbital period about four years and the semi major axis is about 400 astronomical units the orbit is eccentric so in the periaps uh, the star comes uh, down to 100 astronomical unit from the central um, supermassive black hole uh, this is quite interesting because uh, with uh, such stars uh, you can get data uh, more rapidly um, observations, detailed observations of these stars are used to probe uh, theories of gravity um, so that's quite an interesting uh, additional method to look for new physics and of course when you find uh, stars closer and closer to black holes uh, the effect is stronger and you obtain the data more rapidly also there is an interesting question how stars come to these uh, orbits and this question by the way is uh, not answered completely uh, most probably stars participate in several body three body at least interactions in this S cluster uh, around the black hole and so they um, change their orbits, their orbits are modified due to this interaction and so they can be settled on um, very short, very compact orbits uh, very often very eccentric orbits about the central black hole okay uh, this is a record, another record related to neutron stars um, a radio pulsar with the longest spin period 76 seconds that's a huge step forward because the previous record was uh, 23 seconds if I'm not mistaken uh, this pulsar was uh, discovered by uh, Meerkat that's um, a set of radio telescopes in South Africa and uh, 
Also, for this pulsar, the period derivative was measured. If you have a period and uh, period derivative, using the magnetodipole formula, you can obtain an estimate of the magnetic field. And for this radio pulsar, it's quite large, larger than 10 to 14 Gauss. Uh, let's have a look. We see these um, dashed mm, inclined diagonal lines. They correspond to constant field. Uh, estimated with the magnetodipole formula. So 10 to 15, 10 to 14, 10 to 13, 10 to 12, which is called the typical uh, magnetic field of radio pulsar. So you see this line passes through this crowd of dots. Uh, each dot is a radio pulsar with measured period and period derivative, which is on the vertical axis. Uh, well, uh, why this object is interesting? Because we do not know how it was formed. Uh, there are two main options. Uh, normally, uh, radio pulsars evolve from left to right following mm, mm, a line which is parallel to one of these dashed lines. This means uh, that the evolution proceeds with a constant magnetic field. This is fine for radio pulsars. However, together with Andrei Goshev uh, a few years ago, we showed that uh, maybe there is a brief period of time when magnetic fields of normal radio pulsars also decay by a factor of two, but this doesn't change drastically the magnetic field. Uh, the station with magnetars they are shown with these magenta squares is quite different. Uh, magnetars are visible, they shine because of the energy of their magnetic field. So they dissipate this energy and magnetic field is decaying. So for magnetars, evolution is not parallel to these lines, uh, it goes down. And uh, such models help to explain why uh, there are no magnetars with uh, spin periods much larger than 10 seconds. So all evolutionary tracks just goes down here. And then they can uh, stop uh, rapid field dissipation and proceed uh, more or less parallel to one of these dashed lines. Okay, uh, but what about this guy? Um, it's uh, quite improbable that it evolved just from this region of magnetars um, because its magnetic field doesn't look to be dissipated and it's strange. Or maybe it started already with a long period and now there are models to explain it. Um, models at, at least they were modified specifically uh, to explain this object. They include so-called fallback accretion. After a supernova explosion, significant mass uh, uh, fall back to a neutron star. So this mass is gravitationally captured. And interaction of a neutron star with this uh, mass, which can form a disk around the neutron star, can result in significant spin down in uh, slowing rotation of a neutron star. So maybe uh, this new pulsar does not have a real age of 5.3 mega years. Maybe it's much younger, uh, but it was born already with a long period. Then potentially it can be even a magnetar. Uh, we didn't see any traces of magnetar activity from this source, but maybe we have just to wait. And that's quite interesting. Uh, also, I can mention another source uh, widely discussed this year. It's on the top, this gleam blah blah blah, uh, represented by this red error, error, arrow, sorry, and uh, it has been period about 18 minutes, quite a lot. The period derivative is not measured, there is only an upper limit. Um, so this point uh, where this arrow starts is um, the upper limit for the period derivative. So actually, we don't know the magnetic field of this object uh, even more. We don't know if uh, this is a neutron star or not. Potentially, it can be also a white dwarf. In this plot, there is one white dwarf, this AR Scorpi. Um, this is a white dwarf showing um, radio pulsar-like activity. And uh, this source, Glim, uh, is uh, quite intriguing in this respect. Um, okay, let's move uh, on and let's look maybe at another record uh, related to neutron stars. A very massive neutron star, another new pulsar. This is a millisecond pulsar in a binary. And um, this is a pulsar in the galactic disk. Many millisecond pulsars in binaries are found in globular clusters, but this guy is uh, in the galactic disk. 
and uh, for millisecond pulsars in the galactic disk uh, that's the most rapid rotation 1.4 milliseconds um, that's important pulsars cannot rotate more rapidly than one millisecond roughly um, the exact limit depends on many things and some of them are unknown but uh, one millisecond is typically uh, the limit okay uh, this pulsar is a member of a binary and the pulsar is uh, belongs to the class um, Black Widow. So we see that Black Widow is a pulsar with a low mass substellar companion. And uh, previously there was accretion from that companion on the neutron star. So the neutron star was spun up by accretion. That's why a millisecond radio pulsar was born. So these pulsars are recycled. And uh, now the pulsar is irradiating the companion, uh, and so it's evaporating the companion. That's why they are called Black Widow. Okay. Um, many of you know that precise measurements of masses of neutron stars are possible in binary systems with radio pulsars, but when we observe uh, different post Newtonian effects. Um, when uh, we can see up to five effects of general relativity um, and uh, then we can determine the mass with uh, better than one percent precision in some cases. In the case of black widows uh, another approach is used. Uh, people used optical spectral observations of the visible uh, substellar companion and uh, this is quite different. Um, there are some issues with these approaches so um, precision is not as good as for many ra uh, binary radio pulsars. Uh, still now it seems that uh, main problems are solved so this mass determination are quite robust. And for this new pulsar the central value, again I remind you that you never measure a precise value, you measure some distribution. So for this new pulsar uh, shown with blue the maximum corresponds to the mass 2.35 solar masses. Mm, uncertainties are quite significant, so it well can be uh, like uh, how many? 20% of the probability that the mass is below roughly 2.17. That's a very important limit. I mm, on purpose showed it with this thin red line, this vertical line. Uh, but still it can be more, more massive, that's more probable, and this is very important. Uh, what's specific about this 2.17? Um, this is the value of the maximum mass favored by uh, gravitational wave data. Uh, up to now we have just one very good example of neutron star and neutron star coalescence, uh, which produced gravitational wave signal plus a gamma ray burst uh, plus a kilono was observed later on. And detailed analysis of this source, together with some other data, points towards the maximum mass about 2.17. So people like very much that value. Uh, probably here uh, we have a problem. Probably we have a neutron star which is more massive, so that's quite interesting. So we have to wait uh, for new detections of coalescence of two neutron stars and to uh, maybe new observations of this pulsar which might help to uh, make the uncertainty smaller. Uh, as uh, many of you can know, uh, I'm very interested in fast radio bursts and it would be strange if I do not include any <laughs> results about these sources in my uh, short review. So I choose just one result uh, on say normal fast radio bursts. It's quite intriguing. Um, early this year, the preprint appeared in February, uh, people presented a very intriguing result. Um, observations were done with the operative um, system in Netherlands. Uh, this is a burst with a complicated structure, so that's one burst. Uh, duration is you see a few milliseconds, look at the horizontal axis. This is a non-repeating source, so no other bursts from this source were ever detected. And there are five distinguishable uh, components in the burst. And people analyzed uh, the separation between these components. Even by eye you see that um, it looks they, they have the same separation. 
and indeed at uh, significant but not very large probability so the result is uh, less than 3 sigma it's about 2.5 sigmas um, there is a periodicity and periodicity is 0 0.4 millisecond so this cannot be a spin period of a neutron star because neutron stars unless this is a bar quark star cannot rotate that rapidly so this might be something else and that's very interesting because it can have something to do maybe with the uh, uh, the emission mechanism of fast radio bursts. The emission mechanism of fast radio bursts is not known yet. Even there are two families of models. Uh, those who are interested, you can find my uh, short review published in the archive in October. And uh, uh, these two families are uh, magnetospheric. This means that the radio emission is produced in the magnetosphere of a neutron star, of a magnetar most probably, because magnetar models are now more favorable. Or uh, radio emission is generated in a relativistic shock at significant distance from a neutron star. This distance is about 10 to 14 centimeters, quite a lot. And uh, this uh, fine structure of the pulse uh, with um, uh, with a high probability of periodic structure uh, can be a good n not uh, not final but very good argument in favor of magnetospheric models of course you can form similar a similar structure also using a relativistic shock but it's uh, less trivial and it's more natural to say that uh, uh, step by step magnetospheric model starts to win. However, it's not for sure yet and uh, this field of research is quite interesting now and uh, people are um, spending lots of time, investing lots of time uh, to, um, to make new models of emission of fast radio bursts uh, to obtain new observations to, and to confront uh, models against these observations. Um, before I was uh, focused only on papers from the, from the archive, but at the end I want to show two results which are not published in the archive yet. Um, both of them are from October, so they're quite recent. Um, as you know, fast radio bursts were discovered in 2007 and already in 2007 uh, we, together with Pasnov, proposed that magnetars are sources of these uh, events, extragalactic magnetars, because it was sure that sources are extragalactic. However, for years there was a nasty question, uh, why don't we see any fast radio bursts from uh, galactic magnetars? There are about 30 galactic magnetars known and uh, for years they showed nothing like fast radio bursts. But in April mm, 2020, uh, so two uh, and a half years ago, uh, finally uh, people detected the first uh, short radio burst from a known galactic magnetar which was accompanied by a normal, more or less normal, uh, high energy burst. At that time the radio burst was detected by CHIME in Canada and by STAIR-2 in States and by four different satellites, by, um, by the Chinese satellite inside uh, HMXT, by uh, the Italian satellite Agile, by the European satellite Integral and by detectors, uh, Russian detectors CONUS on board of um, uh, the American satellite WIND. Uh, since that time there were no uh, such events from that magnetar. Uh, I mean th there were lots of radio bursts detected from this magnetar, there were lots of X-ray bursts detected from this magnetar, but they never came together. And in October this year the situation changed. Now we have two more examples. They are published uh, yet only in Astronomer's Telegram and numbers are below for those who are interested. Um, I'm sorry that there might be also two other numbers, 15707 and 15708. Uh, this for numbers is for the first burst on October 14, but uh, for the second burst uh, there are two more telegrams. Uh, again, 15707 and 15708. Uh, well, 
Mm, so now we have three examples. That's quite interesting. What is also interesting, uh, however, it's mm, just a preliminary. Um, uh, the first burst detected in um, 2020 was in X-ray somehow peculiar. It was not very typical for that source. But it seems that uh, bursts detected uh, this October, they are more typical. It is also very interesting for the mechanism of fast radio burst emission. And uh, we're waiting for complete papers. Maybe people are submitting their papers to Nature or Science, so it takes quite a long time. Um, when um, these submitted papers pass all steps uh, before they appear in the archive. Uh, another interesting result uh, which was obtained this year is related to um, gamma ray bursts in October again. Uh, a very strong gamma ray burst was detected. Uh, however, it's uh, quite a distant event at the redshift uh, 0 0.15 which correspond uh, roughly to 2 billion light years from us. So by itself, the burst is interesting. It's very powerful, but uh, not just uh, it's energetic what attracted lots of interest. Um, two uh, telegrams, one in uh, GCN and another in uh, Astronomer's Telegram appeared from two different detectors, Lhasa and Carpet 2. Uh, both of these detectors detected very high energy uh, photons from this uh, burst. Lhasa detected uh, 18 TV photon. Uh, th that's all right. That th this is interesting, um, but this can be a explained in standard physics. But the result um, from Carpet 2, th th that's a Russian um, device, is uh, more interesting. Uh, they detected a photon with a huge energy, 250 TeV. This is a problem, because uh, uh, gamma ray with such huge energy simply cannot propagate for 2 billion light years in the intergalactic medium. It might interact uh, with other photons and so you have to invent something new. So you need new physics to explain this result. And that's why uh, many theoretical papers with different approaches appear during these uh, two months. And uh, one of the possibility is that um, the source is emitting not only uh, electromagnetic waves, but also axions, hypothetical particles, uh, which are much welcomed by uh, theorists. And this axion propagate uh, for some distance and then uh, is converted into a high energy um, gamma ray photon. And uh, then uh, we detect this photon, but the photon didn't made all the way from the source towards the observer. That's quite an interesting possibility, but it's uh, necessary to wait um, for a complete paper about uh, this result, about this detection by um, Carpet 2. Uh, because if the energy of this um, event is slightly less, then actually uh, the, the problem is not so strong and it can be explained in the conventional physics. So um, th that's again a very intriguing situation. Well, uh, that's all what I wanted to say about the previous year. Now what we can expect from the next year. Of course, um, the most interesting discoveries are serendipitous. But still we can make some predictions because we know which huge um, instruments will start working next year. And I selected two examples. The first is um, the LSST telescope. This is a huge machine uh, which will start working next year. And um, that's the first really large, that's an 8 meter telescope with very large field of view. So uh, it's not pointing to particular sources, it's scanning the sky. And um, that's a big data project. So people for years developed new algorithms uh, to deal with this data 
and um, there, there are many groups all over the world which will work with this data looking for new transients um, people can study solar system objects extragalactic uh, objects everything uh, they can look for optical counterparts for fast radio bursts so many 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 new tasks can be um, done with this telescope many new for example uh, interstellar comets and asteroids can be detected maybe well I say quite probably that it will find new types of optical transients so we expect many results um, as I said uh, the instrument might start, wor start working in 2023 so maybe first really important scientific results will appear only in um, um, 2024 but uh, it's also not, not so uh, long to wait. Uh, what else will happen next year? Uh, gravitational wave detectors will start their uh, fourth uh, scientific run next year and now we'll have four detectors, two LIGOs, uh, Virgo and uh, Karga in Japan, uh, Kagra sorry, in Japan and uh, what's uh, important that all four detectors were significantly upgraded so they have larger sensitivity, which means uh, more sources to be detected. And uh, it's not just to increase the number. We, uh, we cannot look specifically for interesting events. For, I don't know, uh, new neutron star, neutron star coalescence with electromagnetic counterparts, uh, coalescence of very massive black holes or black holes with huge mass ratio, something else interesting. We have just to look for more and more sources and uh, more sources we detect. High is the probability that we detect something really interesting. And so uh, we can expect that the fourth run will be very productive. It might be quite long, so hopefully. Uh, the third run was terminated a little bit earlier than it was planned because of the um, pandemic. Uh, and um, hopefully the, the fourth run will be okay. And we can expect uh, to have new interesting discoveries uh, from gravitational wave detectors. Okay, that's all. So I'll stop here and hope to bring you new interesting results uh, in a year. Bye.